Hello, my name is Johanna. Normally I make gaming videos in order to avoid writing my thesis, but today I figured why not do something completely different. So instead of avoiding my thesis, I will be making a video about the topic of my thesis. I'll be talking about aphantasia and hyperphantasia and whatever is in between that. So I'll be focusing on ways you can measure your cognitive visualization. But before I get to that, I will be defining what aphantasia, hyperphantasia means. If you already know what it means, just skip because it will be a very basic explanation. I'll put a timestamp down here. I don't know where the bottom of the frame is. Here, timestamp. Skip to that if you already know what aphantasia means. Okay, so what does aphantasia mean? What does hyperphantasia mean? And what is imagery or visualization? I call it visualization, but it's, it's most commonly referred to as uh, imagery or object imagery. Maybe you've experienced in your life uh, school teachers or whomever saying, oh, close your eyes and imagine something. You know, close your eyes and imagine the audience naked. Or close your eyes and imagine you're under the sea. And, you know, it's sort of used as a tool for relaxation. I personally always became sort of frustrated. I had a teacher who always taught us mindfulness in the morning and she asked us to visualize a beam of light and I sort of became frustrated instead of becoming relaxed. And later in life I realized it's because I don't see anything where you may be thinking, yeah, of course it's just a metaphor, right? We don't see anything, right? And if you're thinking like that, maybe you have aphantasia. It's probably more common than we know. So basically aphantasia means that you cannot see anything visually in your mind's eye. You can't produce pictures, not at all, not even blurry ones, not even any, like no pictures at all. You see nothing. You can still do other things, like you can maybe dream pictures. Some people with aphantasia dream pictures. Or maybe you can hear a voice, you can create music in your head. I personally have a, a very high degree of spatial imagery, meaning that I can create movement in my head. If I'm talking about someone who's not there, I will maybe place them at a table and I will sort of cognitively point to where I think they should be sitting. Um, or I'll, like if I'm talking about a building in my city, I'll sort of cognitively point. I won't do anything with my body, but I'll sort of point to where I think they are. But no images. Hyperphantasia, on the other hand, is vivid imagery in your mind. Like you can see images as clear or maybe even clearer than you can see with your, your actual eyes. Uh, maybe you can even project images onto the real world, like in Queen's Gambit. And maybe hyperphantasia is connected to synesthesia. Science seems sort of unclear on that still, but at least one person with hyperphantasia I've talked to had synesthesia as well. So aphantasia and hyperphantasia are the two extremes of visualization. And you can be anything in between. You can have a little bit of image, you can have black and white images only, you can have a sort of blur, or you can have pretty good pictures but you have a sort of hard time retaining the images. Basically, visualization or object imagery is very very different from person to person and it is definitely a spectrum. You don't have to have either of the extremes and it's still sort of something that people discuss what ex how exactly we define the extremes. So all you really need to know is that you can have a lot of pictures, very few pictures, and really like any experience you have is valid, but we're only talking about the pictures here. We're not talking about movement, although the pictures can have movement. We're not talking about speciality or audio. We're talking about the visualization in the mind's eye. So that's aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and the spectrum of imagery. And if you're interested in knowing more about aphantasia and hyperphantasia and all these things, there are a lot, lot of interesting articles about it out there. And I could do another video. I have a lot to say, but I tried to keep it short. So I mean, let me know if you're interested. Today, 
I will just be talking about how to measure visualization. Specifically, I'll be talking about three types of self-evaluation, the VVIQ, the SUIS, and the OSIQ. Additionally, I'll be talking about binocular rivalry, which is the only form of measurement that is not self-evaluation, as far as I know. The VBIQ is probably the most famous one. It stands for Vividness of Visual Imagery Questionnaire. And it was a questionnaire developed in 1973. Yeah, 1973. By Marx. That's a K-S, not an X. And if you're interested in it, you can find it online and try it out for yourself. Basically, the VVIQ asks you to visualize something and then on a scale from one to five, you answer whether what you see is as vivid as real life or whether you see nothing at all or something in between. It's a very, very popular questionnaire because it's so easy to compare and it's so simple. But obviously, it leaves out a lot of complexity and it sort of assumes that there is only one aspect of visualization that is interesting. It doesn't really ask about differences in color, differences in, in light, differences in, in anything really. It just assumes that there is five degrees and that it isn't really a spectrum, but only a 2D scale. So the scale of VBIQ I have it right here, goes from no image at all, I only know I'm thinking of the object, to dim and vague, moderately realistic, realistic and reasonably vivid, and then in the end, perfectly realistic, and vi as vivid as real seeing. So the VVIQ is really interested in comparing your cognitive visualization to the visual ability of your eye. So an example of a question is it asks you to imagine and think of a relative or friend, uh, someone who's familiar to you, and then it asks you, uh, judging on this scale, about different aspects of that, like can you see the exact contours of their face, head, shoulders and body, the poses they do, etc. And it also asks about imagining the sun rising, skies clear, a rainbow. So it sort of takes you through these narratives and asks you to put yourself in familiar situations and then asks you to judge um, your experience in your head. So if you're interested in, in trying out the VVIQ, you can find it online, like just Google VVIQ or go to the Aphantasia network. They have it available there. And it's a really nice pointer that gets you thinking about what's really going on up there. So you can figure yourself out. The second type of self-evaluation I want to talk about is the SUIS, which stands for Spontaneous Use of Imagery Scale. It was developed in 2019 by Nellis Holmes Griffith and Reyes. Like the VVIQ, it asks you to put yourself in familiar settings and really emphasizes the familiar. But instead of asking you to sit down and visualize, it is interested in how you use imagery in your daily life. It takes you through 12 different concepts and then you rate from one to five how you relate to this. So for example, it asks you about your preferences. I have an example. When going to a new place, I prefer directions that include detailed descriptions of landmarks, such as size, shape and color of a gas station, in addition to their names. Or hypothetical scenarios, when I hear a radio announcer or DJ I've never actually seen, I usually find myself picturing what they might look like. So this questionnaire works really well in addition to the VVIQ because the VVIQ asks you to really contemplate and in that moment see what happens, where the SUIS is more interested in what you usually do. Maybe you can visualize when you're really concentrating but maybe you don't really usually do it. So they're really interesting to use alongside each other to create a more wide idea of how the person's cognition works. And if you want to look it up, 
I found it at Harvard University's Costlin Laboratory. Costlin, of course, is a cognitive scientist, and it's freely available to download and try out. The third and last self-evaluation tool I want to talk about is the OSIQ. That stands for Object and Spatial Imagery Questionnaire. The OSIQ was developed in 2006 by Blyankova and Blashevnikov. So if you saw my introduction, it's probably pretty clear that it's both measuring object imagery and spatial imagery. I imagine some people might have skipped the intro because they knew aphantasia, but don't know these terms. So just to make it clear, object imagery is what we usually talk about when we talk about seeing images in your mind, whereas spatial imagery is the sense of spatiality. So you can have spatial imagery uh, while you have aphantasia, which is what I have, I can still point and have directions in my head. My sort of cognition can can have a, a sense of direction and pointing and create movement, not with my body, but just purely cognitively. And that's this sense of spatiality. Sadly, the OSIQ isn't as freely available as the others. But if you have access to academic sources, I'm sure you can find it. But basically what makes this really nice is that if you're unsure of which of your experiences are object imagery and which are spatial imagery, the OSIQ can be a really nice way to ensure that you're actually talking about what you think you're talking about. But again, I would definitely suggest using these different types of questionnaires alongside each other to support each other. So questionnaires are a really nice way that you can start thinking about your own cognition and you can learn a little more about yourself. But for scientific studies, they can also be problematic. I don't have to go <laughs> into detail with that. If you are already an academic, you know. The problem with visualization is that it is really hard to measure. And that's why a lot of the data is just these self-report questionnaires. But there is one method that is quite different from the others, and that is to use binocular rivalry tasks. So basically what binocular rivalry is, is that you're shown two pictures simultaneously, typically one red, one blue, like you experience with 3D glasses. And then the test is whether you can be primed to see one over the other. So the theory is that you should be able to prime yourself imagining the color red in your mind, and that would then prime you to see the red picture over the blue picture. But if you have aphantasia, you shouldn't be able to prime yourself. And if you have a look at the aphantasia network, they do have a page where you can try this on yourself. I must say I am a bit critical of this method. I don't want to, you know, put a lot of opinions out there because I haven't really read much science on, on binocular rivalry. But I imagine that you can still prime yourself simply by knowing um, a lot of the time we talk about people with aphantasia not be being able to visualize, but just knowing that they think of the color red. And I could imagine that you could still prime yourself to look for red or sort of experience red more simply by knowing red in your mind or like repeating red in your mind. But I, I don't want to, you know, I don't know. I haven't really read anything other than Kaywin person on this, so like, don't quote me on that. If you want to conduct a study on aphantasia or anything on the visualization spectrum, like please do more research than just what I've been telling you. But if you're just interested in, in thinking about these things and getting to know yourself, I really recommend going and trying these different sources. Additionally, if you're interested in the subject, I highly recommend going to the eyes mind which is a blog on the University of Exeter developed by Adam Seyman and his whole group. Adam Seyman was basically the person who coined the phrase aphantasia and later hyperphantasia. So I highly recommend supporting his projects. And he also has a questionnaire you can fill out if you want to give him more data on the subject. And also he's really nice, so that helps. <laughs> if you have any questions, like 
feel free to shoot them at me. It's basically what I'm dealing with for half a year, so, you know, I might as well talk to other people about it instead of just keeping it in my head. I'll put a bunch of links down below, and I hope you'll maybe tell me about your own experience. I know I typically only get 10 views, but like if, if you guys could tell me what you experienced, that would be super interesting. I'm always interested in hearing more about people's experiences and people's realizations on this topic. I think it's a really interesting topic. And I don't really talk too much about my thesis, but I can tell you that it's about how people read. So how do people read differently when they have different cognitive experiences and cognitive types? And as far as I know, I'm really the first person to examine this. Matthew Makasak is doing research on artists, visual artists and aphantasia, which is really interesting as well. But I haven't found anyone who's dealing with reading. So if you know someone, some sources, like, let me know. But I love an outro sketch. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something and I hope you had fun. I know it's a nerdy kind of fun, but I hope you had fun. And feel free to subscribe if you want to see more of this or more gaming. I don't know. If you want to see more and see you next time. Maybe next week. <laughs> Bye.